Okay. I guess. I can begin. After me, I'm kind of. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد once again everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so uh, I just want to summarize the essential lesson that's been covered so far uh, and then move on just so everybody's clear it's good to be concise at the end of it all um, the things Allah created in this world for our benefit and for our enjoyment are in and of themselves not evil, except when you overdo them. You get overindulged in them. And as a result, you forget your responsibilities in this life, and you also forget your responsibilities to Allah. They distract you from remembering Allah and your purpose in life, and they also distract you from other responsibilities as, you know, as members of family, as members of society that you're supposed to carry you know, uh, with ihsan. So it's it really, at the end of the day, everything in our deen boils down to balance. And a lot of the Qur'an commentary is about losing that balance. Right? Don't lose that balance. And that's what takathur is, is the loss of that balance. Now we get to the heart of the surah, the middle, which is actually the zajr of the surah. It's the, it's the um, scolding from Allah. This, is so, this angers Allah so much. He says, kalla, sawfa ta'lamun. And kalla is actually like haqqan in Arabic. Kalla means no. Not at all, but this is not just a normal no. Like if you read in English translation, here, here's my English translation of this as I, that I've read before. Nay, soon thou shalt know. Um, I don't know what that even means. Kalla <laughs> is actually when you're getting yelled at. No! You're going to find out soon enough. <coughs> so you don't talk like the kalla sofa ta'alamun is not normal speech. This is the anger of Allah manifest in the way he expresses, you're going to find out soon enough. And it, I'm not even going to soon you will know because the, the verb know doesn't even begin to capture the emotion that's inside the word sofa ta'lamun in the, in the word sofa ta'lamun. And sofa asra' min sa' it's actually uh, um, you know ziyadatul mabna tadullu ala ziyadatul ma'na. The word sofa as opposed to the word sa here the prefix sa Suggest very soon, you're going to know. Oh, you will know, all right. You know, sometimes when you are threatening someone, you say, oh, no, 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 no. I'll get you. I'm going to get you good. Oh, no, you don't even know what you got yourself into. That's that, no, that's the kalla. This is why it's, you know, kalla li zajar wa libtal. It's actually for the scolding. You know, sometimes we listen to recitation of Quran, and it's the opposite of the intent. Kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Like, ah, mashallah. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that's not what's being said here, guys. And then it's not just Allah said it once, He said it twice. Thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Really, the tafsir of the ayah is in the way you're going to say it, it's the way in which it has to be said. You're going to find, oh no, then again, you need to hear this again. Thumma. And thumma tawfidan is mentioned here. This is actually not. It's not, a, it's, it's not actually this continuity that's then this, then this, but it's moreover. I don't think you heard me right. You will find out. This is in Arabic. They say, Aqululak, thumma aqululak. This is the old way of saying it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. We do this even now. When somebody's not listening to you or somebody's not taking you seriously, then you repeat yourself. You don't tell someone something once, you tell them twice, three times. This is what Quran does. No, there's no such thing as, you know, za'ida in the Qur'an. There's no such thing as extra stuff in the Qur'an. Everything is exactly as it's meant to be. So when he says, kalla sawfa ta'lamun, then he says again, thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun. 
This is exactly what we needed to hear. This is exactly what humanity needed to hear. It's the same exact words. Why repeat them? Why repeat them? Because when you repeat them, then the yelling is far worse. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? When your dad does that twice, ah, uh, it's good kind of mirchi. Like, it burns just right, you know, when you hear it twice like that. That's what Allah Azza wa does here. And this is a threat from Allah. And it's twice. Now some ulama went even further and said, okay, in, in addition to it being this tahweel, this terrifying yelling from Allah Azza wa Jalla, this from Allah, additionally, it's also a comment on the stages. You're being taken into the grave. As soon as the descent happens into the grave, now you see what reality was. Everybody thinks you've been put to sleep. But that's actually when you just woke up. And you're going to find out all right. And the questioning, some of the questioning begins right then. Some of it. Some questions are asked then. But when are all the questions asked? When we're going to be taken out of the grave. That's the full interrogation. So there's the brief interrogation, and then there's the full interrogation. So some have interpreted it as, when you're taken to the grave, and you went, at the moment of death, the brief interrogation, and you realize what life really was, and how you've been distracted, that you had no idea. And then when the full interrogation happens, then you'll really know how distracted you were. That's Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That's the su'al that's coming on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the questioning, the interrogation that's coming on the Day of Resurrection. May Allah make all of our accounting and our questioning easy on us. Then is the middle, the very center of this surah. Kalla. No, no, no. Law ta'lamuna ilm al Let's just stop at law ta'lamun. Kalla law ta'lamun. Just this much. No. And this no is a no of frustration. It's actually of hasra. Law ta'lamun. Had you only known, if you only were people who wanted to find out, this is Allah expressing how frustrated He is with the people He's talking to. Now, in the Arabic language, when you say law, then there's a jawab law. Law darasta la najahta. Okay? Law istayqafta la sallayta. If you woke up, you would have prayed. If you studied, you would have succeeded. Had you done this, this would have happened. There's a had part, there's a would have part. To give you an example, had you woken up early, you wouldn't have missed the flight, etc. Right? There's, but in this ayah, there's only the had. The, the rest of it isn't there. Had you only known. Had you only, that's it, that's it, it stops there. Why does it stop there? Allah didn't say, had you only known, you could have saved yourself. Had you only known, this wouldn't have happened to you. He doesn't mention any of that. He doesn't mention any of that because the people he's talking to aren't even worth continuing talking to. He drops it. They're not worth addressing any further. And actually not mentioning what's the jawab law, the, the latter part of the condition, is even more horrifying. When somebody speaks to you like this, had you only been a good son, You don't have to say anything else. You've said everything else by just shaking your head and walking away. That kills it already. You're already dead. This is what Allah does in the middle of the surah. This is the heart of the surah. This frustration from Allah. And this is illustrating that there are some people who are so drowned in their takathur, they're so distracted in their takathur, that they, there's no way to reason with them. They're lost. They're completely lost. No matter how much you try to reason with them, it's like someone on drugs. You can't have a normal conversation with them. They're not in their right mind. They're too drunk on it. And that's why it's not law alimtum. It's law ta'lamun, the mudari, suggesting there's no way for you to even know now. You've completely lost your sense of thinking and knowing and finding out. You're a hopeless cause. You see, the irony of this ayah is that the word law in Arabic is used as hasra. It's used to express regret of what happened in the past. So the expectation from an Arabic point of view was, Kalla law alimtum. Law alimtum. But Allah in this very scary ayah is saying, law ta'lamun, the present tense, as if even your future is a done deal. You people are hopeless even in your future. It's one thing for Allah to comment, you have failed so far. You have, you have been so messed up so far. If Allah says that, then there's hope that I can fix myself, you see? But that, in this ayah, Allah is actually commenting on people who are just a lost cause. Law ta'lamuna. And then he, he de describes what kind of ilm should you have had. Ilm al-yaqeen. 
He says, لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ now the words ilm al yaqeen are difficult to understand. I'll give you an explanation by way of analogy. Inshallah, it'll be easy to understand then. The word yaqeen in Arabic uh, has a few things. Izalatu shak. It's something that removes all doubt. When you're convinced of something without the shadow of a doubt, you have yaqeen. The second thing it has is tahqiqul amr. It's actually set and you never rethink it again. It's not something that you say, I was convinced yesterday, but let me see if I'm still convinced today. You know, sometimes there are politicians who are very passionately one party, and in the next election, they are very passionately the opposite party. There are, po there are politicians like that, right? They're convinced of one thing, and they're very convincing also of one thing. But then, next thing you know, they're convinced entirely of the other thing. Yaqeen is something you don't go back on. Yaqeen is something you don't revisit ever. It's done, you know? And so Allah says, ilm al yaqeen knowledge of absolute certain conviction. Had you known the kind of knowledge that is absolute certain conviction. There are three phrases in the Quran that have to do with yaqeen. There's ilm al yaqeen, there's ayn al yaqeen, there's haq al yaqeen. There's three of them. This surah has ilm al yaqeen and it has ayn al yaqeen. It's coming later on. Okay? La tarawunnaha ayn al yaqeen. It's coming, right? Now what's the difference between them? I'll help you understand by way of analogy. And so that all, uh, even the one that's not in this ayah will understand too, inshallah, which is haqqul yaqeen. It comes at the end of uh, waqi'ah, for example. Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, forget, forget the ayah for a second. I'll give you the, the parable. If you're, if you're driving out in the countryside somewhere and you see smoke, you don't see what? You don't see the fire, but you know there's a fire. How do you know there's a fire? There's impossible to have smoke without fire. So even without seeing, because of the evidence, you are absolutely convinced that there is a fire. If somebody tries to come and tell you, no, there's no fire, I'll say, no, but look at the smoke. There is a fire. The evidence is there. And then somebody comes and tells you, but you didn't see a fire, how do you know? I have ilm al yaqeen, you idiot. There's a smoke, I don't need to see it to believe it. When evidence, knowledge, thinking, leads you to a definite conclusion, that's called ilm al yaqeen That's ilm al yaqeen If you get close enough and you see the fire, you saw it with what? Your eyes. The Arabic word for eye is what? Ayn. Now you believe it's a fire because you've seen it with your own eyes. This is what? Ayn al yaqeen This is the conviction of the eyes. This is, literally says the eye of conviction, meaning the eye that leads to conviction. Like, just like the knowledge that leads to conviction. For Arabic students, the idafa, ilm al yaqeen, ayn al yaqeen, haq al yaqeen. When you have an idafa, two words like that, then you put an av in between them. But that's hard to understand when you translate it. Knowledge of conviction, eye of conviction, truth of conviction. It's not like that. It's actually here you have to translate this idafa as that leads to. In other words, knowledge that leads to conviction. Uh, the eye that leads to conviction. Reality that leads to conviction. You get it? So now, when you say ilm al yaqeen, Allah is saying, how come you didn't, you had all the access to knowledge you needed, we don't see Jahannam. We don't see that fire. But we see its smoke. We see its smoke. And it's, in other words, we see its evidence. And its evidence is in the word of Allah. The word of Allah is absolutely convincing. And if you were to ponder it on yourself, on your own life, then you would know that the akhirah is real that the next life is real. You, you could have arrived at that conclusion without having to seen it. How come you weren't willing to see? Why were you so distracted and not thinking about things you can't see? Because al-haqum takathur You're so busy obsessed with things you can see, you never even wonder what is behind these things. What's behind all of it? Because the akhirah is behind all of this, you see? Allah says, ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ there are people who want nothing but this life. This is as far as their knowledge goes. Even when they think, when they ponder, they cannot ponder beyond this. They, want, they don't want to think there's something behind this. They, they're not the people who say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. You didn't create this without purpose. We, you and I, we had that access. How come you didn't think this way is Allah's, Allah's criticism of them? Now, by the way, uh, the third one I didn't explain. I won't go into detail because it's not in this surah. The third one is haqqul yaqeen. When you are convinced because of evidence, ilmul yaqeen. 
When you're convinced because you saw it with your own eyes, if you've been burnt by fire, you've experienced the reality, the haqiqah of fire, and then someone says, fire? What fire? Look at my hand, bro. The fire is for real. I, I tasted it. I've been stung by it. I've been burnt by it. This is haqqul yaqeen. This is conviction based on experience. It became something very real for you. You know what's amazing about haqqul yaqeen? Allah calls Qur'an haqqul yaqeen. Qur'an, innahu la haqqul yaqeen. Why? Because when you dive into the Qur'an, you will experience the truth. You won't just learn the truth. It'll run in your blood. It'll become part of you. Then it'll become a part of your being. If you've experienced it, it's an experiential kind of knowledge. It's an incredible statement by Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's like, you know, like they say in Arabic, أَعْلَمُ بِهَا مَنْ غَصَّ بِهَا The one who knows it best is the one who's choked on it. Right? Like, you know, the, it's an expression about fish. Like, hey, eat that fish slowly. Ah, no, it doesn't matter. Help. And then, <laughs> you know, I told you eat it slowly because I made that mistake before. You see what I'm saying? The, the idea of haqqul yaqeen is someone who's experienced the truth, the reality. Because you know, when someone truly immerses themselves in the word of Allah, they see the word of Allah fulfill itself around them all the time. They see the ayat of Allah come to life all the time around them. It becomes not just some knowledge they have, it becomes an experience in their life. You know, reality in their life. And so that's, that's haqqul yaqeen. But in this, these, these ayat, Allah is just giving us two. Ilmul yaqeen and by the way, just the distinction between these two. The one that human beings were supposed to benefit from is which one? Ilmul yaqeen. Ilmul yaqeen. Allah made human beings the only creature that can truly benefit from knowledge and arrive at conclusions they can't even see. Actually, much of what we have done on, in this world, what human beings have been able to accomplish on this earth, from technology, in medicine, in architecture, in any field, it's actually because of ilmul yaqeen. We don't see an atom. We cannot see a proton and a neutron. These are subatomic particles. We cannot see them. We can, however, perceive what they're going to be able to do. Well, how we can manipulate these materials, these subatomic particles. We don't have the science. We can measure it. We can calculate it. We can estimate it. But we cannot what? We can't see it. Actually, much of what we've accomplished in life, in this world, is through ilmul yaqeen. Ilmul yaqeen, if you didn't have it, you wouldn't be able to function in society. You wouldn't. Ilmul yaqeen is the thing that, you know, there's an announcement made, there's a fire, please exit the building. If there's an announcement made, there's a fire, there, please exit the building, and there's no fire on your floor. I'm not leaving, I don't see a fire. Nobody else. The, would you believe the announcement? Yeah. Sprinklers came on. You know, the announcement, please exit the building, et cetera, et cetera. If you're on a highway, it's going, traffic is going well, you're listening to the radio news report, and it says three miles ahead, there's a traffic jam. Take an exit if you can. You're not going to say, oh, these kuffar, they're always trying to get me. I'm going in. I'm going to stay on Salat al-Mustaqeem, and I'm just going to, you know, like. <laughs> Did you see the traffic jam? No. You heard from a reliable source that was good enough for you, and you took a detour. Isn't that what you did? The idea of ilmul yaqeen is actually what makes society functional. That's what makes society functional. Ilmul yaqeen is how you progress in your careers. What course should I take? What class should I take? Which job interview should I go for? You have to trust somebody who knows more than you and says, this, do this, 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 and this, and then you can move forward. Our entire iman, Allah is not asking us to believe blindly. He's actually asking us to arrive at it like we arrive at everything else in life. Through ilmul yaqeen. Actually, if the only way you'll be convinced is by seeing, if that means aynul yaqeen, yeah? Then there's no difference between you and a cat, and a dog, and a squirrel, and a monkey. Because those animals are not convinced until they what? Until they see. When they hear there's a fire alarm, the cat doesn't leave the building. But when the cat sees the fire, it runs the other way. Allah gifted the human beings ilm. This book, this revelation is ilmul yaqeen. This book is ilmul yaqeen. 
if you don't take advantage of this book, one day you will stand in front of Allah and you'll see Jahannam and then it will become what? Aynul Yaqeen. It's too late, buddy. It's too late. This is why the Quran is supposed to be Sami'na wa ata'na, ra'ayna wa ata'na. Sami'na wa ata'na. You listen and you obey. You listen, you reason, you use your faculties. That's the gift of Allah in this ayah. لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ And so now, the, as we come, wind down, this is now the conclusion of the surah, these few ayat that are left, 6, 7, and 8. لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ Had you only known with the knowledge of conviction, and it stopped there. Islahi, rahimahullah, in Tadabbur al-Quran actually argues that this ayah is a maf'ul of the previous ayah, which means, had you only known with entire conviction that you will see hell, I personally, wallahu, wallahu ta'ala alam disagree because this ayah is not, the, the knowledge of conviction is not that you will see hell. The knowledge of conviction, the actual conviction is that akhirah is there, life has a purpose, those things. Like Allah doesn't just want us to be convinced that we'll see hell. That's not the message of Allah Azza wa The message of Allah is you'll meet Allah. But these people, these distracted people, Allah says about them, you are the lost cause, there is no way around it. You people are absolutely, absolutely going to see Jaheem. I swear to it, I will make sure you see it. The thing is, the irony inside of this ayah is very powerful. Ru'ya in Arabic is when you look at something. And you look at something that you want to. The eye is a very sensitive uh, uh, faculty of the human body. You don't look at the sun, you avoid eye contact immediately with the sun. Yeah. When you see something disgusting, you can turn your eyes away immediately. You know, turning your body is harder, but turning your eyes is what? Easy. And especially when something is glazing to the eye or difficult for the eye to handle, then we can close our eyes or move the eyes. Allah Azza wa is saying, you have been turning your eye from reality because of takathur all this time. When it comes to jahim, which is far harder than to look at than the sun, by the way, when it comes to looking at Jahannam, I'll make sure you look at it. And you'll keep staring at it. There's no blinking. There's no turning away. I will make you face that reality. And you'll keep on looking at it. Oh, you will look at it already. There's a la. There's a unna. There's a lam of tawheed and qasam. Which means I swear to it, you will look at it. There's two noons at the end, which actually triples the verb. Which means I swear to it, you will look at it, you will look at it, you will look at it. That's what Allah is saying. In la tara unna al jahim. It's actually al jahim. That's the verb. But it's been emphasized three times over. And an oath is qasam. On top of all of that. And then on top of that, why even jahim? This is the scariest part. Allah could have said nar, jahannam. There's so many names of hell. Why use the word al jahim? Jaham in Arabic and juhum in Arabic is actually used for the eyes of a lion. The eyes of a lion right before it rips you up apart. You know the, the pupils dilate on predators when they're about to attack? I took my children one time to a safari not too long ago. In, uh, out in Texas, they have the safari, they have about 100 cheetahs. And they're, you know, usually when you go to these things, the animals are all hiding under the bushes, like, where are they? And they're lazy to come out. You know the craziest way to get them out? Because this is a huge fence, right? It's secure. Make children walk next to the fence, or close to the fence. When they see small prey, their nature overtakes them, their pupils dilate, and they walk alongside. <laughs> it's crazy, I know. <laughs> I didn't do it, I recommended somebody else's children. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when that predator is about to attack and its eyes are just ripped open because it's going to tear into you, the scariest look in those eyes, that's actually one of the names of hell. It stares back at you. It stares back at you. Like a predator that wants to tear you apart. Now the thing is, I, I mean, I've only now, the last two days, or just even today actually, just experienced the tube for the first time. I'm a New York City subway guy. You guys are actually cleaner, let me tell you. But anyway, you know, in the subway, on the train, sometimes there's some guy just staring at you. And you just avoid eye contact every time you just eyes me. Like, and you just every few seconds you go to check, is he still staring? Yep, he's still staring. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody's looking at you like that, it's human nature to do what? Avoid eye contact. Just avoid eye contact. 
especially if someone's dangerous. You avoid eye contact. Like uh, one of the places that I noticed, some people are very good at avo avoiding eye contact here at restaurants, the waiters. You're like, he's, he's, he's right through you. <laughs> They're so good at it, you know? But the idea of jaheem is this roaring flame come to life, staring straight at you. You'd love to avoid eye contact now. Allah says, nope, you'll be staring at it. See, there's a second time that in, uh, an action that is supposed to be voluntary is being used in a context that's involuntary. The first one was ziyara. Visiting is voluntary, but it was used like, whether you like it or not, you're going to visit those graves. You're going to go. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to stare at that jaheem. لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ and then he says, ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ Then, let me tell you again, you are going to be staring at it, and this time with the eyes of a believer. This time you're going to be so convinced. Right now, it all, it's all a joke to you. There's so much entertainment industry made, making fun of the idea of hell. You know, for the... Uh, for, for the Jewish people, the idea was systematically removed from their book. It's not even found in the Hebrew Bible anymore. In the Christian Bible, it's actually in the New Testament, it is found. There is some mention of hell. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there's uh, some oral literature that has some mention of Gehnam, which is close to the Arabic word Jahannam, right? So we have, uh, but even that is actually just a valley where trash is thrown. That's, that's the worst of it, you know, for them. But for us, it's a very serious issue. Muslims don't make jokes about hell. It's not a laughing matter to us. Allah has described it in such graphic, scary terms that it's not, it's not a joking thing. But on the other side, unfortunately, what happened to the people of the book before us, this became a joke. So they had like heavy metal bands, like you know, skulls with like flames on them, and highway to hell, and like you know, we're. Halloween parties where people are dressed like devils and flames and all this stuff. Like to them, it's just a it's just a joke. To us, it's not. It is most certainly not a joke. And I would actually advise you, just as part of our adab in speech, I don't give fatawa. You guys know that, I think. But just part of our adab in speech, don't use the word hell as an expression in your speech. Like what the hell or what the hell are you doing or how the hell are you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Don't do it. This is, this is actually making light of something that's very serious in our religion. Don't, don't, don't make light of it. When if you've had a hard time and you say, ah, I've been through hell. Nope, don't say that. It's better for you not to say that. Because subconsciously, then the word becomes casual. I wouldn't want for any Muslim this word to become casual. They just, just wouldn't. I'm having a hard time, I'm having a difficult time. All of that's fine, but you know, don't take it any further than that. Now, as I come to the, to, to the end of this surah, you're finally going to see it with, the, with convincing <coughs> eyes. The last ayah of the surah, then after all of that, now they're staring at the fire. They're staring at it. They're complete. And by the way, when you're staring at something horrifying, are you distracted? If you're staring at something, hor like if you saw a car accident, are you distracted? You're just looking at it? If somebody's talking to you while a car accident happened, would you even be listening? No. But Allah will make you stare at that fire, and then the questioning will begin. No room for distraction now. Look at the irony. Allah began the surah with distraction. And Allah ends the surah with a scene where you have all the justification to be distracted. The only thing preoccupying you now should be the view of hell. This, this thing you're staring at that's taken over your mind. It may be even driving you insane. And at that time, Allah will start interrogating you. Then you will all be interrogated. You will be questioned exhaustively. And then again, the lam and the noon, you'll be questioned, you'll be questioned, you'll be questioned, I swear to it, three times over. That's inside the verse. On that day. What will you be questioned about? You'll be questioned about the constant luxury that you lived in. The word na'im comes from the word ni'mah. Ni'mah it also has an origin. Ni'mah, I think many of you know, know means blessing, right? In Indo-Pak languages, we say ni'mat, right? But ni'mah comes from the Arabic word nu'umah. And nu'umah means softness and luxury, ease and comfort. This is why cattle, cows, sheep, they're called an'am because they move softly. They don't pounce and bounce like, you know, dogs do or 
lions do or you know other animals do they move very smooth and soft that's why they're called an'am anyway coming back to the word ni'ma ni'ma is something that brings comfort in your life brings softness in your life from it when you get the word na'im it actually means luxuries that you enjoyed constantly this is sifa mushabbaha they call it in arabic fa'il so luxuries and comfort you enjoyed constantly they were always there you took them for granted you will be asked about them when allah says this subhanahu wa ta'ala He's actually highlighting something. People that are very, very bad in this world, because this is the this surah is predominantly talking about people who were just indulged in this life. The worst of the kuffar, really. Sometimes they have a lot of luxury and they get away with it. Muslims see that luxury that they have. They have money, they have cars, they have planes, they have wealth, they have assets, they have militaries, they have everything. And we feel frustrated. Why do they have all this stuff? And when you read a surah like this, you say, oh, that's why they have all this stuff. Because they'll be asked about it. Because Allah wants them to be asked. He wants, to be, he, he wants them to be interrogated about every last one of those luxuries. Now there's two items left that I want to, to uh, talk to you about. One is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that uh, I wanted to go through. And this is how even though the message of the surah was to the disbeliever, of course it still applies to us, right? There are so many relevant lessons for ourselves. And so uh, take note of this, this beautiful, beautiful narration of the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> The messenger came out of his house. We don't, I'm not sure if it was day or night time. In other words, I'm not sure if he had been out all day or he just came out at night time. That's what the narrator is saying. Abu Huraira <laughs> And he passed by all of a sudden, he ran into Abu Bakr and Umar. He said to Abu Bakr and Umar, why are you out this late hour? Why are you guys outside the house? So he's out, but he's not sure why they're out. They said hunger, messenger of Allah. We're starving. We just went out looking for food. He says, uh, and I, I swear by the one who has my life in his hands, I swear by Allah, the same thing that brought, brought you out, brought me out too, and got me to stand up. I couldn't sit anymore. So I just stood up and started walking. So they both got up along with him. فَأَتَى رَجُلًا مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ فَإِذَا هُوَ لَيْسَ فِي بَيْتِهِ فَلَمَّا رَأَتْهُ الْمَرْأَى قَالَتْ مَرْحَبًا وَأَهْلًا So they saw a man from the Ansar and then his wife also welcomed them into their house. Okay? Now, فإذا, uh, then he says, فَقَالَ لَهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَيْنَ فُلَانْ So he asked her, the wife, where is he? قَالَتْ يَسْتَعْذِبُ لَنَا مِنَ الْمَا He went to draw some water for us from the well. إِذْ جَاءَ الْأَنصَارِ فَنَظَرَ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ So the Ansari comes back from the water, and he sees the Prophet is sitting there, and Abu Bakr and Umar are sitting there, and he says, وَصَاحِبَيْهِ He saw both of his companions, ثُمَّ قَالْ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ this is the first thing that comes out of his mouth. Alhamdulillah. Ma ahadul yawm akramu adyafan minni. There has never been a day in my life that I've had more of an honor in terms of guests than this day. Wow, nobody's more, nobody is more honored today than I am. Rasulullah is sitting there. Abu Bakr is sitting there. Umar bin Khattab is sitting there. So he's so happy. Fantalaq. So he went ahead. Faja'ahum bi'adkin fihi busar wa tamar wa ratab. Faqal. So he gave him whatever little food he had. Some dates, some dried up food, whatever old, and he didn't have a lot. He's starving himself. So he gave him whatever little he had. And the Prophet ﷺ eats it. So you, you should at least drink, drink you know, the, the, the milk, draw from the animal. So he, they, drank, they drank the milk and they, he slaughtered the animal. So they ate from the sheep. وَمِن ذَلِكَ الْعَذْفُ وَالشَّرِبُ So they drank too. فَلَمَّا شَبَعُوا وَرَوَوْا And so now they've had good meat, they've had milk, they, they ate to their fill, and they've drank enough. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لِأَبِي بَكَرْ وَعُمَرْ So Abu Bakr, uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi turns to Abu Bakr and to Umar and he says the following. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear to the one who holds my life in his hands. لَتُسْأَلُنَّ you are going to be interrogated about the blessing of this day on the day of resurrection. Allah will ask you what you were. أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُيُوتِكُمْ الْجُوعَ Hunger brought you out of your home. ثُمَّ لَمْ تَرْجِعُوا حَتَّى أَصَابَكُمْ هَذَا النَّعِيمِ 
and you didn't co go back home until Allah gave you these blessings. Allah will ask you, were you, and what does that mean Allah will ask you about these blessings? Let's understand that. Does it mean Allah will question them? How many bites did you take? Allah is going to ask them how grateful they were, how appreciative they were. We have to be appreciative, especially about food. Especially about food. Leaving leftovers at restaurants, not finishing a drink. Give it to somebody on the street. Give, just don't throw it away. Take le order less. You know, when you're hungry, guys, when you're hungry, I'll have three burgers. <laughs> you eat half a burger. Ah. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't want to. I, don't, I can't even look at anything else. When the, when the you know, the azima takes over you because of the hunger, you just order the restaurant. <laughs> you know? And then reality kicks in. Order less. Just tell yourself, okay, I'll have one. If I feel like more, I'll take more later. Just, you know, hold yourself back. Because this is something we will be asked about. This is the na'im that we enjoy all the time. لا تزول لا تزول قدما ابن آدم يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن خمس خمس حصار. The Prophet says the feet of the son of Adam will not be able to move until five five categories are asked about. And he says, عن عمرك فيما أفنيت. What did you spend your your youth in? What did you spend your life doing? وعن شبابك your lifespan meaning. وعن شبابك فيما أبليت. What did you exhaust your youth especially in? وعن مالك من أين اكتسبت وفيما انفقت. And about your money, two questions will be asked. Where did you earn it from? And where did you spend it? <laughs> two things. Not just that I earn halal, then I do whatever crazy stuff I want. Earn halal and then spend in limits. وَمَا عَمِلْتَ فِي مَا And how much did you learn and what, what of it did you act on? Did you actually, you learned a lot, you listened to a lot of lectures. A lot. How much of it actually changed you at all? How much of it affected you? These are the questions that you and I are going to have to answer. This was the second last thing and now the final thing that I want to share with you, inshallah ta'ala, as I conclude. And that is the nidam of this surah, the beautiful architecture and structure of this surah. Eight ayat. Eight ayat that, that form actually a complete symmetrical whole. And so I want you to visualize this with me when you go home, open the surah and see this for yourself. Yeah? The first two ayat are about how distracted we are. al takathur hatta zurtum al Okay? You're gonna, you, you've remained distracted until you ended up in the grave, visiting the grave. When the surah ends, Allah Azza wa mentions the exact opposite of distraction. You are not distracted when you're being questioned on every little thing that you overlooked, that you dismissed, that you didn't think about. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And that, by the way, that day is the day where all lahu disappears. All distraction disappears. That's the day of yaqidha. So it began with distraction, it ended up with the, end, the, the, end, the ultimate conclusion to distraction, waking up and being interrogated. Okay, now the second piece of this surah is two statements. Kalla, sofa ta'lamun. Thumma kalla, sofa ta'lamun. How many times is knowing mentioned? Twice. Two threats. And if you go from behind, Allah mentions you have to stare at Jahannam how many times? Twice. La tarawunna al jahim. Thumma la tarawunna ha ain al yakin. Twice above, twice below. Perfectly balanced. And then right in the middle is actually the tragedy that human beings have suffered. <laughs> had you only had knowledge that is based on certainty, meaning knowledge that leads to certainty. What is the message of this surah? Learn, think, learn this book. Learn this book so that it can get you to certainty and it can remove distractions from your life. So as I, you know, the, the takeaway lesson that I want to share with you after discussing this architecture of the surah, when you study surahs in this way, when you get to the middle, right? The middle is actually the, the heart of the message, the, the real point that's being made. So Allah is telling us something very important for ourselves to keep ourselves in check. Human beings by nature, we get distracted. That's just what we are. Allah calls us insan. And insan, it's argued, comes from the root nisyan, which means forgetfulness. Human beings by nature are forgetful. So even though you're sitting in the masjid and I'm giving a dars right now, we're in the state of remembrance of Allah and may Allah accept it from all of us.
That doesn't mean two hours from now I am in this state and you're in this state. It doesn't mean that. We get distracted, things happen, you know, we, we get pulled in multiple directions, right? Your relationship, your regular relationship with the Quran, something every day, something every day from Quran will keep you on, the, on ilmul yaqeen. It'll keep you focused. It'll take, yes, distractions will happen. If they're, they're, they're a necessary part of life. They're unavoidable. They're unavoidable. They will happen. But so long as the book of Allah is some healthy dosage of it, is a part of your life, then inshallah ta'ala, distraction will be maintained, it'll be kept under, un, you know, within healthy limits. It won't do what Allah Azza wa is warning us of here, that it won't do ilha, alhaakum with takasub. You won't end up in that state, you know? So to give you a reminder, you have a really bad argument with your wife, or a really bad argument with your parents, or something like that. Then you just get a little reminder from Quran. And you realize whatever problem I think is huge, compared to the problems that are coming in front of me when I stand in front of Allah, this is actually uh, pretty small. I think we can get over this. You know, we can get, you just put things in perspective. That's what Allah does. He puts things in perspective. Then sometimes you're just you're overwhelmed by problems at work or financial or this or that, and you just open up Allah's book just a little bit, and Allah will remind you that He's Ar Razaq Dhul Quwwat Al Mateen. He's the ultimate provider. And you'll just be at ease. Look, I'm going to do whatever I can, but Allah will take care. Some mother will be, how many mothers I've met in this trip is unbelievable who are frustrated with their sons. I don't know what you sons are doing, guys. I don't know what's up, but just go give your mom a hug and apologize or something. That's your homework assignment today. <laughs> but like, how many moms, like my son doesn't pray anymore, he doesn't listen anymore, he doesn't do this anymore. I ask, how old is he? And she says, he's 25. I say, inna lillahi wa inna Mother, the pen has been lifted from you. You are no longer responsible for your son. Quite honestly, he's not a child. I mean, he's going to be a child to you until he's 75, but he's not technically a child. He is an adult, and he's answerable to Allah for what he does. And your concern for him is because you can't help yourself, you're a loving mother, that will never go away. But know that Allah is not holding you accountable. And then, then, you, then that mother opens up Quran, and she reads about Yaqub alayhi salam and his sons. And all he could say is Allahu al-Musta'an. He can't control what his sons do. You know? Sometimes you have, diff some, some sons here have difficult parents. My parents just don't listen. They're just always yelling. I don't know what to do. I do everything I can. And they just can't get through to them. They want to get involved in this haram business. And they want my money to use to, to, use to get into the haram business. And my dad says, if you don't do it, you're no longer my son. And all of it. That kind of drama happens all the time. And that son opens up Quran, and he reads Ibrahim salam being kicked out of the house by his father, and he says, okay, you know what? People have gone through tougher things. It's all right, I can, I can find some comfort in this book. This book will give you comfort, it'll give you strength, it'll give you ilmul yaqeen, it'll give you that conviction. How will it do that? You know, alhamdulillah, the Muslim ummah is very good at listening to recitation of Quran. We put it in our cars, we, we download stuff on our phones, we listen to recitation, keep that going. But recitation of Qur'an for most of you does not give you the message of the Qur'an. You hear the beautiful voice, you hear the wonderful tajweed of the Qur'an, and that has its barakah, no denying it. But what will give you ilmul yaqeen is not the qira'ah of the Qur'an, it is the risala of the Qur'an, the message of the Qur'an. Which means if, you're, if your preferred language is Urdu or Bangla, or if it's Somali, or if it's Arabic, or it's English, whatever it is, Listen to some explanation of Qur'an from somebody. Download that stuff, stick it in your ear. While you're commuting, while you're getting pushed around on the bus, just listen to some message of Qur'an every day. Something, just a little bit. This is not so you can take notes and you can give a halaqa later. This is not so you become a student. It's because you need to be exposed to the message of Allah's book. We need it like, you know, the earth needs rain, water, and without the water, the earth dies. Allah compares Qur'an to rain. And we are the earth, our hearts are the earth. Without this constant water, the heart starts dying, right? So be exposed to the message of Allah's, uh, Allah's words. May Allah Azza wa make us of those that are constantly being exposed to His words. May Allah make us a people of ilmul yaqeen so that we don't have to come in front of Allah one day and then finally see ayn al yaqeen. May Allah make us of those whose ilmul yaqeen is enough for them that we are ready for meeting Him in the most successful of ways. 
May Allah Azza wa Jal give us a better and better understanding of the Quran and make an endless place for it in all of our hearts and make it a means by which we, we the light by which we see all reality around us. May Allah Azza wa Jal especially strengthen the mothers of our community and make them able to raise the generation of Muslims that will carry Islam further than it's ever been carried before. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, I've finished writing a book on it. Yeah, he's writing a book. We need some tea. It's called Divine Tea. Yeah. It'll be available on Amazon. It's more exhaustive than that. It's far, far more comprehensive than the one I wrote. It's uh, I think almost 300 pages. Water before it falls. I'm here. No, no need to push. <laughs> Sit down. 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 I have no idea to take this. Now I need to take a picture. Who's that bad guy? Who me? That was a bad guy. Oh, I need to go back, please.